Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. You're listening to Encouragementology, and we are talking about releasing fear as a factor. Fear, rational or irrational, is real. How you feel, justified or not, is important to you, so it's worth exploring. Because having fear is one thing, but being controlled by fear is definitely different. Think about your fear right now. Fears that you were alerted to today, and fears you've carried around your whole lifetime. What kind of role do they play in your life? Fear can be exciting, and fear can paralyze you. We're going to be talking about all aspects of this natural reaction, how to harness these emotions, and how to overcome their power. Ready to dig a little deeper into what makes your heart race and your palms sweat? Let's start with fears that you've carried throughout your life. Fears that might have developed as a result of something that has happened or an idea that someone else has planted. You might have a fear of a dog because of a dog bite at an early age. Sounds reasonable. Maybe you're afraid of water as a result of a close call. Whether it's heights, snakes, the dark, or even the boogeyman, fears can be terrifying and panic inducing. I'm going to share two of mine. Both are pretty irrational, but to me, they seem uncontrollable. I hate June bugs. I don't like any bugs, really, but June bugs are particularly unpredictable. You know, you're outside enjoying a lovely summer evening. Bugs are out and minding their own business, or so you thought. Then without any warning, bam, one comes out of nowhere and it's buried in your hair. So buried that you become a raving lunatic trying to get it out. Can you picture it? I can, and it's making my skin crawl just thinking about it. My father always assured me that I am so, so much bigger than that little bug, and there's no way it could possibly hurt me. And as logical as that sounds, my fear is overwhelming. Okay, number two might even be harder to believe. Hi, my name is Kendall, and I'm afraid of balloons. Giant fun ruiner, party of one, your table's ready. Imagine my poor kiddos' faces when I told the hostess to skip the balloons at the table, and there was no need suggesting picking one up for the ride home. Being trapped in a car with a balloon? Out of the question. This might be a good time to talk about what does afraid actually mean in this instance. Of course, I've done the math. What could possibly go wrong? What am I afraid of? The pop? I'm not sure, but all I know is I'm very uncomfortable being around balloons. They cause me to be distracted, wondering where they're going to waft to next. I don't like the sound of them being twisted, so balloon art is out. Mylar ones are the worst because they lose steam and then they're way more elusive and they even follow you around. I can remember going to a trade show to set up my booth and seeing a gigantic cluster of balloons tied together and hanging over my booth. I looked around. I thought I was being punked. Needless to say, maintenance quickly moved them away. To me, these fears just showed up one day and started dictating how I feel about certain things. What is the difference between fears and phobias? I found some valuable advice in an article for helpguide.org from Melinda Smith, Robert Siegel, and Dr. Jean Ann Siegel. What is phobia? Almost everyone has an irrational fear or two of spiders, for example, or your annual dental checkup. For most people, these fears are minor. But when fears become so severe that they cause tremendous anxiety and interfere with your normal life, 
They're called phobias. A phobia is an intense fear of something that, in reality, poses little or no actual danger. Common phobias and fears include closed in spaces, heights, highway driving, flying insects, snakes, and needles. However, you can develop phobias for virtually anything. While most phobias develop in childhood, they can also develop later in life. If you have a phobia, you probably realize that your fear is irrational. Yet you still can't control your feelings. Just thinking about that feared object or situation may make you anxious. And when you're actually exposed to the thing you fear, that terror is automatic and overwhelming. The experience is so nerve-wracking that you may go to great lengths to avoid it, inconveniencing yourself or even changing your lifestyle. If you have claustrophobia, for example, you might turn down a lucrative job offer if you have to ride the elevator to get to your office. If you have a fear of heights, you might drive an extra 20 miles in order to avoid a tall bridge. Understanding your phobia is the first step to overcoming it. It's important to know that phobias are common. Having a phobia doesn't mean you're crazy. It also helps to know that phobias are highly treatable. No matter how out of control it feels right now, you can overcome your anxiety and fear and start living the life you want. It's normal and even helpful to experience fear in dangerous situations. Fear serves a protective purpose. It activates our automatic fight or flight response. With our bodies and minds on alert and ready for action, we're able to respond quickly and protect ourselves. But with phobias, the threat is non-existent or greatly exaggerated. For example, it's only natural to be afraid of a snarling Doberman, but it's irrational to be terrified of a friendly poodle on a leash. Just because you have a dog phobia, natural environment phobias such as a fear of heights, storms, water, or even the dark. You could also have situational phobias. These are triggered by a specific situation, including the fear of enclosed spaces,、uh, flying, driving in tunnels or bridges. You could also have blood injection injury phobia, the fear of blood. Injury, illness, needles, or any other medical procedure. Some phobias, however, don't fall into any one of these categories. These include the fear of choking, the fear of getting a disease like cancer, and a fear of clowns. Other common phobias that don't fit in any of these four categories are social phobias, also called social anxiety. It's a fear of social situations where you may be embarrassed or judged. If you have social phobia, then you may be excessively self-conscious and afraid of humiliating yourself in front of other people. Your anxiety over how you will look, what others will think, it might lead to you avoiding certain situations or just not enjoying them. A common one is a fear of public speaking. This is a type of social phobia. Other fears associated with social phobia include fear of eating or drinking in public, talking to strangers, taking exams, mingling at a party, or being called upon in class. Agoraphobia was traditionally thought of to involve the fear of public places and open spaces, but it's now believed to develop as a complication of panic attacks. If you're afraid of having another panic attack, you become anxious about being in situations where escape would be difficult or embarrassing. You're likely to avoid crowded places like shopping malls or movie theaters. You may also avoid cars, planes, subways, or other forms of travel. In more severe cases, you might only feel safe at home. The symptoms of a phobia can range from mild feelings of apprehension and anxiety to a full-blown panic attack. Typically, the closer you are to the thing you're afraid of, the greater fear you will have. Your fear will also be heightened if getting away is difficult. 
You could experience difficult in breathing, racing or pounding heart, chest pains or tightness, trembling or shaking, feeling dizzy or lightheaded, a churning in your stomach, hot or cold flashes, tingling sensations, sweating. Emotional symptoms could also include the feeling of being overwhelmed, anxiety or panic, feeling an intense need to escape a situation, feeling unreal or detached from yourself. Fear of losing control or going crazy. Feel like you're going to die or pass out. Knowing that you're overreacting but feeling powerless to control your fear. Although phobias are common, they don't always cause considerable distress or significantly disrupt your life. For example, if you have a snake phobia, it may cause no problem in your everyday activities if you live in the city where you're not likely to run into one. But if you have a severe phobia of crowded spaces, living in a big city could pose a problem. If your phobia doesn't impact your life that much, it's probably nothing to be concerned about. But if avoidance of the subject, object, or activity does trigger your phobia and it interferes with your normal functioning life or keeps you from doing the things you would otherwise enjoy, it's time to seek help. You can consider different types of treatment for your phobia if it causes intense and disabling fear, anxiety, or panic. You recognize that your fear is excessive and unreasonable. You avoid certain situation and places because of this phobia. Your avoidance interferes with your normal routine or causing significant distress you've had the phobia for at least six months. There's lots of way to treat it. Self-help strategies and therapy can both be effective in treating a phobia. What's best for you depends on factors such as the severity of your phobia, your access to professional therapy, and the amount of support you need. As a general rule, self-help is always worth a try. The more you can do for yourself, the more in control you feel, which goes a long way when it comes to phobias and fears, conquering it, empowering yourself. But if your phobia is so severe that it triggers panic attacks or uncontrollable anxiety, you may want to seek professional help. Therapy for phobias has a great track record. Not only does it work extremely well, but you tend to see results very quickly sometimes in as little as one or four sessions. However, support doesn't have to come in the guise of a professional therapist. Just having someone to hold your hand or stand by your side as you face your fears can be extremely helpful. Phobia self-help tip number one, face your fears one step at a time. It's only natural to want to avoid the thing or situation you fear. But when it comes to conquering phobias, facing your fears is the key. While avoidance may make you feel better in the short term, it prevents you from learning that your phobia may not be as frightening or overwhelming as you think. You never get the chance to learn how to cope with your fears and experience control over the situation if you don't face it. As a result, the phobia becomes increasingly scarier and more daunting in your mind. The most effective way to overcome a phobia is by gradually and repeatedly exposing yourself to what you fear in a safe and in controlled way. During this exposure process, you'll learn to ride out the anxiety and fear until it inevitably passes. Through repeated experiences, Facing your fears, you'll begin to realize that the worst isn't going to happen. You're not going to die or lose it. With each exposure, you'll feel more confident and in control. The phobia begins to lose its power. Okay, are you with me? I shared two of my phobias, irrational as they are, before the break. So I hope you're listening to that. Tip number two, learn to calm down quickly. When you're afraid or anxious, you experience a variety of uncontrollable physical symptoms, such as 
a racing heart, or that suffocating feeling. These physical sensations can be frightening in themselves, and a large part of what makes your phobia so distressing. By learning how to calm yourself down quickly, you become more confident in your ability to tolerate uncomfortable sensations and face your fears. Perform a simple deep breathing exercise. When you're anxious, you tend to take quick, shallow breaths. This is also known as hyperventilating, which actually adds to the physical feelings of anxiety. By breathing deeply from the abdomen, you can reverse these physical sensations and feel less tense, less short of breath, and less anxious. Practice these when you're feeling calm, okay? So don't do it right in the middle of a panic. Do it when you're feeling calm so you get sort of the feeling of what it feels like and you get comfortable with it. Sit or stand comfortably with your back up straight. Put one hand on your chest and the other hand on your stomach. Then take a slow breath in through your nose, counting to four. The hand on your stomach should rise as you do that, and the hand on your chest should move very little. Hold your breath for a count of seven. Exhale through your mouth to a count of eight, pushing out all the air as much as you can while contracting your abdominal muscles. The hand on your stomach should move in as you exhale, but your other hand should move very little. Inhale again, repeating the cycle until you feel relaxed and centered. Practice this deep breathing technique for five minutes twice a day. Maybe you have those watches that give you the little buzz when you're supposed to be breathing or standing up. You could use that as a trigger. When you're comfortable with the technique, you can use it when you're facing your phobia or in any other stressful situation. Another thing that you can think of when you start getting that panicky feeling and the quickness of your breath, start telling yourself how excited you are because as we said in the beginning, this can actually be, fear can be an excitement feeling as well as a panic feeling. So they're very similar. You can talk yourself into out of fear and into excitement by telling yourself, Ooh, this tense feeling. I'm so excited. Something amazing is about to happen. And you're actually talking yourself into that. One of the most quickest and reliable ways to relieve anxiety is by engaging one or more of your senses, like sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, or through movement. But since everyone is different, you'll need to do some experimenting to discover what, what works best for you. So movement could be Go for a walk, jump up and down, or stretch. Dancing, drumming, or running can be especially effective at relieving anxiety. Sight. Look at anything that relaxes you or makes you smile, like a beautiful view, family photos, cat pictures on the internet. Try looking at the trees or the sky. It's such a wonderful painting and it's very calming. Maybe the wind is blowing and you're watching the rustling of the, the leaves. You're just getting lost in that, um, that sensation. Sound. Listen to soothing music. Sing a favorite tune or play a musical instrument. Or enjoy the relaxing sound of nature. Maybe it's ocean waves. Wind through trees. Singing of the birds. Maybe just the stillness. Smell, light scented candles, smell the flowers in the garden, breathe in clean, fresh air, like if you don't have allergies, um, freshly cut, cut grass, something like that, maybe after it rains. Spritz on your favorite cologne or perfume. How about taste? Slowly eat a favorite treat, savor each bite. Sip a cup of coffee or herbal tea, chew on a stick of gum, enjoy a mint or a favorite candy. Touch. Give yourself a hand or a neck massage. Cuddle a pet. 
Wrap yourself in a soft blanket. Sit outside in the cool breeze. It's important to begin with a situation that you can handle and then work your way up from there, building your confidence and coping skills as you move up the fear ladder. Make a list. You know me and my lists. Make a list of the frightening situations related to your phobia. If you're afraid of flying, then on your list, in addition to the obvious, such as taking a flight or getting off, you know, getting through a takeoff, you might want to include things like booking your ticket. Maybe even booking your ticket gives you anxiety. Packing your suitcase, driving to the airport, watching other planes take off or land, going through security, boarding the plane, and listening to the flight attendant present the safety instructions. Build a fear ladder so you would arrange the items on your list from the least scary to the most scary. The first step should make you slightly anxious, but not so frightened that you're too intimidated to try it. When creating the ladder, it can be helpful to think about your end goal. For example, to be able to be near dogs without panicking, to be able to pick up a balloon in a restaurant and put it in your car. Then break down the steps needed to reach that goal. Work your way up the ladder. Start with the first step and don't move on until you start to feel more comfortable doing it. If possible, stay in the situation long enough for your anxiety to decrease. The longer you expose yourself to the thing that you're afraid of, the more you'll get used to it and the less anxious you'll feel when you face it the next time. Once you've done a step or several, in separate occasions, without feeling too much anxiety, you can move on to the next step. If a step is too hard, break it down into smaller steps and then go slower. This is your pace. Practice. The more often you practice, the quicker your progress will be. Don't rush. Go at a pace that you can manage without feeling overwhelmed. And remember, you will feel uncomfortable and anxious as you face your fears, but the feelings are only temporary. If you stick with it, the anxiety will fade. Tip number three, challenge negative thoughts about your phobia. When you have a phobia, you tend to overestimate how bad it will be if you're exposed to the situation you fear and underestimate your ability to cope. The anxious thoughts that trigger and fuel phobias are usually negative and unrealistic. By writing down the negative thoughts you have when controlled by your phobia, you can begin to challenge these unhelpful ways of thinking. Many times these thoughts fall into the following categories. Fortune telling, for example, this bridge is going to collapse. I'll make a fool of myself for sure. I will definitely lose it when the elevator doors close. Or overgeneralization. I fainted once while getting a shot. I'll never be able to get a shot again without passing out. That pit bull lunged at me. All dogs are dangerous. Or catastrophizing. The captain said we're going to go through turbulence. The plane is going to crash. The person next to me coughed. They might have a virus. I'm going to get very, very sick. It's also helpful to come up with your some positive coping statements that you can tell yourself when facing phobias, like, I felt this way before and nothing terrible happened. It may be unpleasant, but it won't harm me. If the worst happens and I have a panic attack while I'm driving, I'll simply pull over and wait for it to pass. I've flown many times and the plane has never crashed. Statistically, flying is very safe. Well, my kids are grown. I rarely go to birthday parties that involve balloons. 
How important is it that I conquer this one? I'm just kidding. It's super important. I'm still learning things about myself, my fears, and my capabilities. I'm not done evolving, and my journey isn't over. Even though I can't control everything that happens in my life to me and otherwise, I can work on controlling my actions to them. It's important for every other aspect of my life not to leave a snag unexplored. It's there. It isn't rational. It must be dealt with. Who's with me? What about fears that are situational, temporary, or suggested? Words are powerful, and marketers learned long ago the power of suggestion, well, is powerful. In an age of information overload, is everything you hear, see, or read good for you? Could too much information be damaging the way we perceive the world and our place in it? How can you safely glean what you need to stay informed while creating a healthy boundary to protect yourself from the rest? Remember three TV stations? Eh, maybe there was six. The news was sprinkled in at specific and predictable times during the morning, evening, and before bedtime. That's when your parents took control over the TV in your house, right? It was an hour, and it was, or at least it seemed to be, just the facts. No opinions, just the facts about what was happening in the world, good and bad. I don't remember my parents having a choice based on politics, and I'm not sure they needed one. The feeling was a healthy dose of news, human interest stories, local and national, and then plenty of time for family. Today, with 24-hour news on multiple stations slated based on your political views, do you feel more informed? Do you feel more in touch and involved with what's happening around you? Is it healthy to hear the good, but mostly the bad and ugly, 24 hours a day? I found a very interesting article on Psychology Today called If It Bleeds, It Leads, Understanding Fear-Based Media, and it's by Dr. Debra Sarani. News is a money-making industry, one that doesn't always make the goal to report the facts accurately. Gone are the days of tuning in and being informed straightforwardly about local and national issues. In truth, watching the news can be a psychological risky pursuit, which could undermine your mental and physical health. Fear-based news stories prey on the anxieties we all have and then hold us hostage. Being glued to the television, reading the paper, or surfing the internet increases ratings and market shares. But it also raises the probability of depression relapse. In previous decades, the journalistic mission was to report the news at it as it actually happened, with fairness, balance, and integrity. However, capitalistic motives associated with journalism has forced much of today's television news to look at the spectacular, the stirring, and the controversial as news stories. It's no longer a race to break a story first or to get the facts right. Instead, it's to acquire a good rating in order to get advertisers so that the profits soar. News programming uses a hierarchy of if it bleeds, it leads. Fear-based news programming has two aims. The first is to grab the viewer's attention. In the news media, this is called the teaser. The second aim is to persuade the viewer that the solution for reducing the identified fear will actually be in the news story. If a teaser asks, what's in your tap water that you need to know about, a viewer will likely tune in to get the up-to-date information to ensure safety. The success of fear-based news relies on presenting dramatic anecdotes in place of scientific evidence, promoting isolated events as trends, depicting categories of people as dangerous and replacing optimism with fatalistic thinking. News conglomerates who want to achieve this use media logic by tweaking the rhythm, grammar, and the presentation format of news stories to enlicit the greatest impact. Let's remind you of that again. 
news conglomerates who want to achieve this use media logic by tweaking the rhythm, grammar, and presentation format of news stories to elicit the greatest impact. Did you know that some news stations work with consultants who offer fear-based topics that are prescripted, outlined with points of view shots and have experts at the ready? This practice is known as stunting or just add water reporting. Often these practices present misleading information and promote anxiety in the viewer. Another pattern in newscasts is that the breaking story doesn't go beyond the surface level. The need to get the story to get the ratings often causes reporters to bypass thorough fact checking. As the first story develops to a second level in later reports, the reporter corrects the inaccuracies and missing elements. As the process of fact finding continually changes, so does the story. What journalists first reported with intense emotion or sensationalism is no longer accurate. What occurs psychologically for the viewer is a fragmented sense of knowing what's real, what sets off feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, experiences known to worsen depression. An additional practice that heightens anxiety and depression is the news station's use of the crawl, the scrolling headline ticker that appears at the bottom of a television screen, communicating breaking news. Individuals who watch news-based programming are likely to see one, two, or even three crawls scroll across the screen. The multitasking required to read the crawls and comprehend the actual newscast comes easy to some viewers, whereas others report feeling overstimulated. One could easily change the channel to interrupt the transmission of such information. However, crawls are not regulated to just news channels. Unlike viewing experience of the past, crawls are now more prominent during entertainment programs and often serve as commercials for nightly newscasts or the upcoming weekly news magazine. The crawls frequently contain fear-driven material, broadsiding an unexpected viewer. It's been said that fear-based media has become a staple of pop culture. The distressing fallout from this trend is that children and adults who are exposed to media are more likely than others to feel that their neighborhoods and their communities are unsafe, believe that crime rates are on the rise, overestimate their odds of becoming a victim, and consider the world to be a dangerous place. News media needs to return to a sense of proportion conscience, and most important, truth-telling. Until that happens, help inoculate yourself against feeling overwhelmed by doing some of the following. Consider limiting your exposure to media. Give yourself a set time once or twice a day to check in on local or global happenings. Consider choosing print media for your information gathering rather than visual media. This can reduce the likelihood that you get exposed to emotionally laden material. Homepages on the internet can give you an overall sense of what's going on, as can headline news channels that update stories on the hour. Remember that you have the power to turn off the remote, leave a website, or change the radio station. Don't let yourself be passive when you feel media is overwhelming you. Know that other people will have a different tolerance for media stories and their details. If someone is expressing too much of a story for your own comfort, walk away or communicate your distress. Consider having an electronic free day and let your senses take in the simpler things in life. Releasing fear is not as easy as deciding, this is the last day you're going to be afraid. It's a great declaration and one that needs to be made, but that's just the start. Next, you have to be willing to face the fear, challenge it, try to adopt new coping strategies, and most importantly, stay consistent. 
You have to want freedom more than you want to be afraid. Bad things will happen, and sometimes those things hit a little too close to home. But remembering that you too have power and a position in how you run your life gives you the needed encouragement to try. If you want to share encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they are not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, evaluate your fear to uncover the source. Don't accept defeat, but realize you can assert your authority and make real changes in your life. You deserve peace, freedom, and all the power that is available to you. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. Someone through to the path was clear. That's when I found you.